He was to be dedicated to God as a Nazarite. He had a good upbringing. He grew up in the church. He attended SDA school from elementary through college. He went to AY and Pathfinders, etc. He grew up being taught of the Lord at home, and his parents did everything that God instructed them to do. Yet Samson still became a tragic story of what if. The sobering thought in all of this is that godly parents are no guarantee that your child will make good choices. You can do everything you think you know to be right. But your son or your daughter still has to make his or her own decisions to follow Christ themselves. Sometimes as parents, we may beat ourselves up when our children choose a path outside of the will of God. I know I do at times. And yes, some of that is the result of our own slackness in modeling to them the way we should live. But the life of Samson reveals that even when parents follow what they believe and know to be the will of God, their offspring may still go astray. But when you see your child making decisions that cause you pain, when you see them choosing the wrong person to date, when you see them going to a place they shouldn't go, when you see them eating something they shouldn't eat, when you see them listening to something they shouldn't be listening to, when you see them smoking something they shouldn't be smoking, when you see them struggling to know who Christ is for themselves, our job is not to just repeat the same thing we've told them a hundred times before. Our job is to be the godly parents that God called us to be. Remind them that they are loved by us and by the God of the universe. And stay on our knees praying for them and claim God as his promises. In Proverbs 14, 26, the word of God says, In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children would have refuge. And in Isaiah 49, 25, another promise says, I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. So I'm here to tell you, if your child is one of those choosing his or own, own way, stop beating yourself up, stay on your knees, keep lifting them up, because God is not through with them yet. The story continues in Judges chapter 14, looking at verses 1 through 3. Word of God says, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people? that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Go get her for me, for she pleases me well. Now Samson goes down to Timnah, and the Philistine honey catches his eye. He immediately tells his parents to get her for him to be his wife. Now we know in that culture, marriages were arranged by the parents, and his parents tried to talk him out of it. Although technically, they were sort of at fault too because they really didn't have to do it. But they even suggested he find a wife among his own people. But Samson wasn't having it. Uh, them church women just didn't do it for him. <laughs> it's no secret that Samson's weakness was women. But just not any woman, it appears he had a certain type. He also had an ego so large that it probably couldn't fit in his room. But see, Satan knew what Samson's weakness was. And he no doubt came right after it. And just like with Samson, 
The enemy comes at us with a customized plan for our weaknesses. So he studies us individually because what he tries for me is not the same thing that he's going to try for you. See, and that's why we can never walk around as if we have it all together, looking down on others that have different weaknesses than we do. We are not in any position to compare each other's sins because the fact of the matter is we all have something. And my something is no better than your something. But notice what Samson says at the end of verse 3. Some versions say, he said, for she pleases me well, but I like what the English Standard Version says. It says, she is right in my own eyes. Now, this is the same wording that is used in Judges chapter 16 and verse 7. In Judges chapter 16 and verse 7, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. As was often the case, this was a time when Israel would practice roller coaster religion. They would turn away from God, begin worshiping idols, get put into captivity, repent, turn back to God, usually led by someone who was faithful to God. And Samson served as a model for those who followed him. But because of his struggles as a judge and a leader, right after he, he died, it says this in the very next chapter. In verse 6, that everyone in Israel did what was right in their own eyes. You have to be careful of the impact that you have on others around you and those that will follow you, whether it be someone on your job or someone on the basketball court or someone even in the church, someone in your own family, even your children and your grandchildren. Be careful because they are watching you. The story continues and progresses in Judges chapter 15, verses 5 through Judges, I'm sorry, Judges 14, verses 5 through Judges 15. Now, we don't have time to read the whole story, so I'll summarize some of it for you. Samson goes down to Timnah. On his way there, he kills a lion with his bare hands. And later when he returned, he saw the same lion carcass and ate honey out, out of it from a beehive. Then he came up with a riddle for the Philistines to solve. But they convinced his wife to tell them. So he got upset and killed 30 men to pay the bet that he made when he thought they couldn't solve it on their own. After that, he acted like nothing happened. He went back home. By the way, being a Nazarite, he wasn't even supposed to be near a dead body. And after some time, Samson went back to his wife, and he found that she had been given to the guy who was the best man at his wedding. He was so upset that he caught 3,300 foxes, tied them together by their tails, and set them on fire to burn up all the grain fields and olive orchards. How long did it take him to catch 300 foxes? But here's the point I want you to see. Although Samson's choices caused all of this turmoil, he blamed others for his poor decisions. Now wait a minute, Samson. It was you who married a Philistine against your parents' wishes. It was you who came up with a riddle and a bet that you thought only you would know. It was you who told your wife what the riddle was so that she can tell her countrymen. And it was you who had a tantrum after the fact, went back home, left your wife, and blamed it all on them when she was given away to another man. How many times do we blame others or even God for the consequences of the poor choices that we make? 
God didn't tell you to drop out of school simply because you got tired of going to class and doing homework. Now you're scrambling trying to find some sort of direction in life. God didn't tell you to get into that relationship and end up marrying that person that makes you miserable. God didn't tell you to go out and buy that new car, even though you only had $5 left in your savings account. Now you don't have enough money to pay your electric bill. And yet, we find ourselves in the messes that we made. We want to cry out like Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God says, no, my child, I haven't forsaken you, but your decisions have consequences. So I need to let you experience some of those consequences. And just like I was with Samson, even when it looked bleak, I'm still with, here with you because I gave you a promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you. As you have seen time and time and time again, because my word is true, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So now we get to Judges chapter 16, which is the beginning of Samson's downfall. After Samson blames other people and goes on an uncontrollable rant, he goes to Gaza and meets a prostitute. Let's just say he gets very friendly with her. While he was sleeping, he gets ambushed. He wakes up, picks up the gates of the city, and takes them to the top of, his, of the hill on his shoulders. At this point, the ambushes begin to rethink some of their life choices. Then he goes and meets Delilah, who ends up capturing his heart, among other things. So Delilah, prompted by her countrymen, began enticing him to find out the secret of his strength. Of course, it goes on to describe how Samson made up stuff to her. First, it was the seven bowstrings. Then, it was if you tie me with new rope. Then it was weaving his locks together. But each time, Samson woke up and broke out of it, just as he had done before. And of course, he goes on to describe, he, I'm sorry, here's where, where when reading this, you start to question Samson's brain function. Three times she, sent, she set you up, Samson. Three times you tested her and she failed. Then comes the ultimate line. She says to him, how can you say you love me when your heart is not with me? And there it is. The old, if you love me, you would do X, Y, Z. Now, I'm so thankful that I don't hear that from my wife, but some of you fellas may know exactly what Samson's talking about. Then in verse 16 of chapter 16, the Bible says that she pestered him every single day. So much so that his soul was vexed to death. Mercy. Yeah, I'm going to leave that one alone. So Samson went out and told her the truth because in his mind he loved this woman. And just like the three other times before, she betrayed him. And you know how the story ended from there. Samson went to sleep again, and she once again shouted, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Except it was different this time. But all that happened in chapter 16 was just a narrative up to this point. The point I want to leave with you is found in verse 20. In Judges chapter 16 and verse 20, it's one of the saddest texts in all scripture. 
To me, it's right up there with Matthew 7, 23, when Christ tells people to depart from me because I never knew you. In verse 20, it says, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. And here's the point. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Although Samson looked different now because his hair was cut off, when he woke up, he felt the same as he did as when he went to sleep. He thought that he could rise up and handle business like he did all those times before. However, he did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson was struggling from spiritual arrogance. He thought because the Holy Spirit of God was upon him that he was straight. So that day would be just like any other day. He kept playing with fire, getting cozy and comfortable with sin, and he thought it was no big deal. How many times, Samson, did God try to show you that you were in the wrong relationship with the wrong person? How many times, Samson, was the Holy Spirit pleading with you to turn and run like Joseph did with Potiphar's wife? How many times, Samson, do you have to fall for the okie doke and share your secrets with not one, but two women who pressured you until you gave in? How many times, Samson, do you ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit and instead try to be a people pleaser? How many times do we walk around with the same spiritual arrogance because the Holy Spirit used us to preach a powerful sermon or used us to sing a spirit-filled song or used us to pray a heaven-moving prayer or used us to tell someone on, job, on our job about the Lord? How many times does that spiritual arrogance lead us to think that we can get cozy and comfortable with sin? And when the time comes, we think we will wake up, go out as we did before with the Spirit of God on us. How many times would it take us? Now, right now, you may be thinking, I thought this was a sermon about restoration. Not just about Samson's failures. Well, the story ain't over yet. At this point, in Judges chapter 16, Samson hits rock bottom, which is where many people have to get before God gets their attention. Things are looking dim for Samson. He is now bald, blind, and in prison doing hard labor. But then we get to verse 22 in, in chapter 16. And it starts with the word, however, and in some translations, it says, but. Although I'm not an expert on the English language, however, I do know that when the word but is used, whatever happened before that, there's a transition that's about to take place. The Bible says, but the hair on his head began to grow again. Now, on the surface, this seems like an insignificant statement. I mean, really, a whole verse just to state that his hair was growing back? But when you dig under the surface, you understand why this is so significant. The actual hair was significant because, was insignificant because there was no power in the hair. But there is a Bible verse written about it. So then it starts to mean something. When God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 by telling him to get circumcised and promised that he would be the father of many nations, it wasn't about what it was. It was about what it stood for. In Exodus, when God delivered the children of Israel by telling them to put the blood of the lamb on each door, doorpost so he could pass over the houses with the blood. 
it wasn't about what it was, it was about what it stood for. In Numbers chapter 21, when God told Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, whoever looked on it would be alive after they were bitten by a snake. It wasn't about what it was, it was about what it stood for. In Joshua chapter 6, when God told Joshua to march seven times around Jericho and on the seventh time to blow their trumpets and the walls came tumbling down, it wasn't about what it was, it was about what it stood for. So when the Bible says in Judges chapter 16 and verse 22 that the hair on Samson's head began to grow back, it's not about what it was, it was about what it stood for. It meant, as it did in every other instance that I just named, that the power of God was once again falling on him. When the hair follicles began to get restored, God's spirit was also restored. And therefore, Samson was being restored. Not because of anything that he had done, but it was because God chose him to be consecrated to himself. And all that Samson did before that wasn't enough to keep God away from still loving him, from still showing him mercy, from still using him, and from still restoring him. Now the rest of the chapter in, verse, in chapter 16, verses 23 through 30. Now Samson's life is coming to a seemingly tragic end. He's paraded out like a court gesture and in, as entertainment for the Philistine leaders and their guests. And when he saw them, he began to praise. When they saw him, they began to praise their own God, their God of Dagon, and said, Our God Dagon has given Samson into our hands. Okay, Samson had to be brought down a few pegs because he didn't follow God's will. But now you're giving credit to a false God? God now has to show himself strong once again. You should have left well enough alone. Well, you know how the story ends. Samson is taken to the main pillars of the building where he once again called on the name of the Lord. But I read in Psalm 91, 15, where it says, when you call on me, I will answer. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. So even after all of what Samson went through, he knew to call on the name of the Lord one more time. And God heard his cry, and he gave him strength to destroy the enemies of God. And that's the last we hear of Samson until we get to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 starts off defining what faith is. We all know it now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And it provides a list of titans of faith and what many of them did by their faith. Talked about how faith, by faith, how Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was recommended as righteous. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he could not see death. By faith, Noah condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a foreign place and also offered up Isaac. These are some heavy hitters. And this is the Faith Hall of Fame. These are the best of the best. It goes on to talk about what Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and Moses, and the children of Israel, and even Rahab did by faith. Then it says, and what more shall we say? And there isn't enough time to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson. 
and Samson? Did that mean to say and Samuel? No, because in the very next statement it talks about Samuel. So it's not a typo. And Samson, after all the foolish decisions that he made, and Samson, after he went astray from the will of God, and Samson, after he made bonehead decision after bonehead decision, and Samson, after he was exposed by his weaknesses, and Samson, and Samson. In the list with the best of the best, he's there because of two words. But God. Despite all of the mess that he got himself into, Samson had a but God moment. And God is still in the business of restoring that which looked like it should be condemned. The Apostle Paul, he puts it this way in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Yes, and Samson. Because God is merciful. And he's in the restoring business. Someone here today, if you will bow your heads with me. Someone here today is looking for this opportunity to be restored with God. Whether you have given your life to him before and, or not at all, you never have. Understanding that God is in the restoration business. I'm not suggesting that he's going to save you or save us in our sins. What I'm suggesting is he's going to save us from our sins. So if you're here today right now, and you feel the urge and the need to be restored to God, I just want to ask you to raise your hand. It might not be, a, or you may feel convicted to be restored to a person, to a family member, or someone in your job, or someone else in your life. That's you, I want you to raise your hand. If you need God to restore you, your relationship with him, or you need him to restore a relationship with somebody else, whatever it is, God is not only willing, but he's waiting for the chance to restore you. And then there might be somebody here like I said, have never made the decision to give their life to Christ. And you want to do that today. 
or you made your a decision and you feel the need to come back to him by getting rebaptized, I would like to invite you to come forward. Is there someone here today? You'd like to make a decision? Give your life to Christ for the very first time or you'd like to get rebaptized and feel the need to restore your relationship with him. Father God, thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us. Thank you for this story of restoration that we can be encouraged from through the life of Samson. Though it all, he didn't always follow your will, yet God, he had sense enough to call on your name one more time. And so God, because of that, because he turned back to you, he's listed in Hebrews 11 with the titans of faith. So God, I just want to say thank you for giving us this example that although we might falter, wouldn't we call on the name of the Lord and turn back to you? You are not only willing, but you're ready to restore us. So we just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name.